Hi, I'm Grace, a speech and language therapist. And in this video, I'm gonna be talking with you about how to use Forebrain with children with speech sound disorders. Speech sound disorders are disorders that affect the way that children's speech sounds. It's an umbrella term that encompasses three types of disorders, articulation disorders, phonological disorders, and motor speech disorders. Intelligibility refers to how well we are able to understand a child when they speak. Typically developing children should be roughly 50% intelligible by two years of age, 75% intelligible by three years of age, and by the time they're four, they should be 100% intelligible. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are pronouncing everything perfectly, just that we are able to understand what they are saying. Children with speech sound disorders do not hit these intelligibility milestones and are often difficult for unfamiliar listeners to understand. This can lead to frustration, loss of self-esteem, and even embarrassment around speaking, so it is important that we intervene early. One of the tools that I use when I work with children with speech sound disorders is the Forebrain. The Forebrain is a wireless headset that has a microphone, a dynamic speech filter, and it uses bone conduction to amplify speech so that when we wear it, we can hear ourselves in real time just slightly louder. It is designed to be a complementary tool used alongside other evidence-based practice methods as a part of speech and language therapy. It can also be a tool that can be used at home for carryover practice in between sessions. One of the important things that the forebrain does is boosting the auditory vocal loop. The auditory vocal loop is a naturally occurring process that we all do every time we speak. I'm using my auditory vocal loop right now as I talk to you about the forebrain. As I speak, I hear or perceive my own speech. I then analyze what I've heard and then I adjust accordingly. When I wear the forebrain, I can hear my voice louder thanks to the microphone and this bone conduction. And it makes it easier for my brain to then analyze what it's heard and adjust accordingly. For children with speech sound disorders, their auditory vocal loops are often not functioning well, meaning that they are not monitoring their own speech well and can be unaware of how they sound. One of the things that we often hear when we correct a child with a speech sound disorder is, but that's what I said, because they're unaware that they are not pronouncing things correctly. The little boost that the forebrain gives the auditory vocal loop can make a huge difference for a child with a speech sound disorder when it comes to awareness and monitoring their own speech. Introducing the forebrain is easy for the most part because most children are pretty curious about it, but I still like to do a slow, no pressure introduction where I will show the child the forebrain, I'll show them how it looks on me, I'll show them how it looks on mom and dad, I'll let them handle it for a little bit, all while using an excited voice and facial expressions to make sure that they know that it's something fun and exciting. I'll then say, it's your turn, and I'll help them to place it on their head. But I make sure to always have something present that enables them to see how they look with it on. Either a mirror or a cell phone camera are perfect for this. I'll also take photos and videos of the child wearing the forebrain so that they can look at them later. Children respond so positively to this. They love seeing how they look with the forebrain on because they think they look super cool. Some children might be more sensitive than others or maybe more anxious around trying new things in general and that is totally fine. We would just introduce the forebrain at a slower pace with no pressure. The key elements to a successful introduction for these types of children are taking your time, taking turns with a child, and going slowly. Reading books together is a nice natural way to build in taking turns, where I might wear the forebrain for one page and then the child wears the forebrain on the next page. Flashcards can also be great for an even shorter turn. I will wear the forebrain for one flashcard and then the child will wear the forebrain for one flashcard. Some children might also benefit from wearing the forebrain on different parts of their body before we put it on their ears. Their turn might just be touching the forebrain on their leg, touching the forebrain on their arm, holding it in their hands or anywhere else on their body so that they see that it's not something that hurts or is scary before trying it on their ears. Remember, it is not a race and it may take multiple sessions before a child is comfortable wearing it on their ears and that is okay. When it comes to how long to wear the forebrain for each day, the experts at Sound for Life recommend aiming for 10 minutes per day for children under five, or 15 minutes per day for children aged five to 15. Ideally, these should be done in one block, but they can also be spread throughout the day. Some children really love wearing the forebrain and will want to keep it on for longer, and that's fine too. If the child is happy to wear the forebrain and they're benefiting from it in therapy sessions, then they can keep it on for as long as they like. So the big question is, 
how exactly do we incorporate forebrain into therapy sessions as speech and language therapists? As we mentioned earlier, forebrain is a complementary tool that is designed to be used alongside the other evidence-based practice methods that we are already using in our sessions. So we basically just continue with therapy as usual, but have the child wear the forebrain. The first thing to do when working with children with speech sound disorders is to choose our targets. And there are many different ways that we can do this. Some of the things that I take into account when choosing targets are, which sounds impact the child's intelligibility the most? Which sounds is the child stimulable for? Which sounds are developmentally appropriate for the child to be saying right now? Or if we're taking the complexity approach, which later developing sounds could have an impact on other sounds if I target them first? If we're working with children with childhood apraxia of speech, we need to make an inventory of all the sounds that they can make and then choose target words with different syllable shapes that include the sounds that they can already produce. Once we have chosen our targets, depending on the diagnosis, I will sometimes start with auditory discrimination activities to make sure that the child can hear the difference between the target sound and the sound that they are substituting it with. Some children do okay with these types of activities without the forebrain, but if a child is having a hard time discriminating, then we can use the forebrain to give them a boost. To include the forebrain in these types of activities, I will have the child wear the forebrain, but have the microphone pointed towards my mouth so that they can hear the target sounds clearer. I will first start with the sound in isolation and use visual cues so that the child is able to point to which sound they hear me say, or even nod their head yes or shake their head no if I say the right sound or not. Once they're at 90% accuracy with sounds in isolation, I'll either use the sound in words in initial position or final position, or head straight into teaching the target sound. When I begin teaching a target sound, I like to start in isolation, but move quickly into using the sound in words. I will use lots of different types of prompts and feedback to help the child. I'll use visual prompts like exaggerating my own mouth placement for the sound, tactile prompts like touching certain parts of the child's face to facilitate the movement, and auditory prompts like telling a child specifically where to place their tongue, teeth, and lips, or cute little cues to help them remember. Like if I'm working on a s sound, I might say something like, big smile, show me your teeth, and remember that your tongue has to stay in his house to remind them that their tongue has to stay inside their mouth for s. I will also give specific feedback on how it sounded or looked. Oh, I saw your tongue that time. Make sure he stays home. Let's try again. Or that sounded a little bit slushy. Let's try make it smooth. I want the child to become more independent in monitoring their own speech so that they're not relying on me to prompt them and give them feedback. So I love to include types of feedback that enable the child to monitor themselves. Mirrors are great for this so that the child can see if their mouth looks like it's doing the right thing. And forebrain is another tool that the child can use to have feedback to monitor their own speech because it helps them hear their speech clearer. Often when I'm working with a child on a new sound that they had previously been saying incorrectly, I'll have them wear the forebrain, they will say the sound that they had previously saying incorrectly and then have a very surprised look on their face as if they are hearing themselves clearly for the first time. Like, oh, that's not what I thought I was saying. For children with articulation disorders, multiple oppositions can really help the child gain mastery of a target sound. And if we use the forebrain at the same time, then we can have even quicker progress. Multiple oppositions are where we have words that only differ by one sound. For example, if a child is having a hard time with their ul and replaces it with a w sound, then we would include words like lie, why, sai, tai, and hi. We would play some type of typical structured therapy game like pop up pirate or monkeying around. And before we take our turn, we have to say one of the cards three to five times. The child can wear the forebrain to help them monitor whether or not they're producing the sound correctly. If the child's speech sound disorder is a more severe phonological disorder, meaning that they're using many phonological processes in their speech and that they're hard to understand because of this, then a cycles approach might be the best approach to try. This is where we target one phonological process at a time for a certain period of time and then move on to the next phonological process after a set period of time and continue cycling through all the processes until all the processes have disappeared from conversational speech. The typical set period of time is 60 minutes per phonological process, which works out as one to two sessions. 
Or if the child has a cognitive impairment, then we can double the time we spend on a phonological process, so two hours or two to four sessions. We can have the child wear the forebrain to monitor their speech during the cycles approach, and I found it particularly helpful for initial and final consonant deletion, S clusters, fronting, backing, and gliding, because the child is able to hear themselves clearer and better able to monitor their own speech. Let's look at some case studies of how I have used the forebrain for different children with speech sound disorders. Josie was a four-year-old girl that was completely unintelligible to unfamiliar listeners because she was using a lot of very unusual substitutions in her speech. She had elements of both an articulation disorder and a phonological disorder, with her main difficulty being with all the fricatives. So, s, z, f, v, f, sh, ch, and j. She would use final consonant deletion if the sound appeared at the end of a word. She would replace with a glottal stop if it was in the middle of the word. And if it was at the beginning of a word, she would replace with a u, a w, or a b sound. Because of her severe unintelligibility and the multiple phonological processes, but also some elements of an articulation disorder, we did a cycles approach, but also included oppositions. One of the key elements to Josie's therapy was wearing the forebrain. The first session that she wore the forebrain, she took an instant liking to it and was very happy to keep it on for most of the session. We began working on an activity with the word sock and Josie said lock as she usually would, and then stopped herself and looked shocked, and then said into her microphone, sock, as if she was testing out the target sound and finally hearing herself and monitoring herself correctly. For the record, Josie had previously been a child who was incredibly frustrated at being corrected, and she was absolutely adamant that that's what I said. So her being able to self-correct was absolutely monumental. Josie's progress was phenomenal, and she began using all of her sounds in conversational speech after the second cycle. She was discharged after only 10 weeks of speech therapy. Without the forebrain, Josie would not have gained the ability to self-correct so rapidly, and her therapy would likely have taken a lot longer. A second case study is Maxime, a seven-year-old boy with a diagnosis of autism and apraxia of speech. Before I started working with him, Maxime was not using speech to communicate and was barely able to imitate any sounds or vocalizations. We of course began teaching him to use augmentative alternative communication in the form of a communication device for functional communication, but Maxime's family really wanted us to try and work on his speech to see if it would be possible for him to communicate a little bit verbally. One of his biggest barriers to speech was vocalizing. He would make his mouth copy the same shape as my mouth when I would model him simple vowel and consonant sounds, but his voice was either non-existent or a low whisper. We began therapy using the principles of motor learning and also tried incorporating the forebrain to see if it would help. The first session we used the forebrain, I immediately noticed that Maxime was vocalizing while he was wearing it. His voice was no longer a whisper we were able to begin practicing his voice in basic syllable shapes with simple consonants and vowels. And although it has only been one month of therapy currently, he already has two words that he can now produce clearly. Maxime and Josie are very different children, both who presented with speech sound disorders and found that the forebrain was beneficial as a complementary tool to their therapy sessions. It particularly helped with their own awareness about their voice and speech, which led to quicker progress overall. Forebrain is an excellent tool to use to complement traditional speech and language therapy methods when working with children with speech sound disorders. It can be used both in sessions with the therapist and at home with the family for carryover practice. I'm very happy to have the Forebrain as part of my therapist toolkit and I love being able to share it with the families on my caseload.